What's up, everybody? It is the best spot, Kid Smooth, and yes, it's finally here. My full review of Asterigos, Curse of the Stars. Let's get into it. Stop right there. Wait, are you from Avis? And from the looks of you, you're with the North Wind Legion, but a child. You know of the North Wind Legion. Have you seen any others? No time for that now. You're coming with me. All right, guys. Curse of the Stars is a fantasy third-person action RPG game inspired by the Greek and Roman mythologies. Play as Hilda, a brave young warrior from Northwind Legion, who is on a journey to the cursed city in order to save her lost father and others along the way. As I mentioned in my gameplay preview last week, Astera Ghost Curse of the Stars reminds me of Immortals Phoenix Rising with a gameplay formula heavily inspired by the Soulsborne genre. The difference here is a compelling story. You have the main character in Hilda, who is a red-headed warrior who has charm and a relatable personality. She's stubborn, cute, and persistent. Hilda is on a journey to find her father and fellow warriors from the Northland Legion, the, uh, the Northland Legion, who embarked on a mission before her. During her search, she is stopped and interfered by an elite warrior named Bion, who brings her to a shelter led by Minerva. From there on, Hilda is given guidance and objectives to complete from Minerva, who agrees to help Hilda on her journey if she helps her. This is the no, you help me, I help you questline. It's not new, but this is pretty much where a majority of Hilda's work is going to come from, is doing tasks for Minerva in different cities, different areas, liberating them from this curse. Each region offers boss battles, loot, and secrets and side quests along the way. I found the story to be very good. Key plot characters are fully voiced, while some other quest lines and interactions are not fully voiced. It must be read via text. The game does a good job making use of its relatively small scale. Each area feels bigger as you unlock new paths and find new dungeons on your way. I spent nearly 50 hours in my first run with nearly 10 plus of those hours revisiting areas I'd beaten uh, before but didn't discover new locations up until my second run around. Decisions and choices. The game throws some choices at the player that are met with consequences that impact your story moving forward. So what happens if I avoided the fight with Barad, the Lord of the Black Street at the start of the game? Many of the main characters were disappointed when they learned of his demise, despite the trouble he caused. What would have happened if I beat Bayan during our first encounter? Losing that fight had me at Minerva's mercy. Off the bat, the game does a great job telling the story and telling other stories throughout the journey, whereas your typical Souls-born games rely heavily on lore and environmental storytelling. The gameplay loop. From the start, you have access to multiple weapons, six to be exact. However, you can only equip two at a time and use elemental elements from others in specialty move if you choose to. Coming off the likes of Elden Ring and Assassin's Creed Valhalla, my primary weapons were sword and shield and a staff for range attacks. I made sure to max out these both and heavily and it heavily determined how I would play the game moving forward. Without the sword and shield, you can't block or parry as effectively. Without the daggers, you can't pull off extended combos or dodge as fast. Without the hammer, you can't pull off moves that impact and hit multiple enemies at once. Hilda also gets these elemental enhancements. Uh, you get enhancements that include electric, fire, ice, and magic, all being required to get access to specific chests, take certain, take out certain enemies, open new pathways. You will have to use some form of these elements throughout your gameplay. And on top of that, there's additional skill trees, additional moves, additional upgrades for those elemental uh, powers. The skill tree was my favorite part of the game. I've reset my skill tree probably five times to see which series of combos and executions was most useful to me. Those players will find themselves very comfortable with this game. I recommend Asterigos for those who are just getting into the Soulsborne because it is accessible. You have some sort of control of how difficult the game can be. Difficulty settings include story, which is an easy equivalent, adventure, which is the normal equivalent, and then there's the challenge mode, which is on par with your typical Souls experience. So in other words, a little hard. <laughs> 
I have completed this game on adventure mode, which is the normal equivalent, and I completed my game on the Xbox Series X. I've also started a playthrough on PC on the challenge difficulty. The comparisons to Souls-like games comes with the, its uh, conduit system. In Asteragos, players will unlock conduits, which is an equivalent to bonfires. At the conduits, you will rest or teleport. Uh, to other conduits you have unlocked in the game. Now, teleporting and resting will cause enemies to respawn much like bonfires. Instead of earning souls, you earn stardust. Stardust is the in-game currency you will use to replenish potions and upgrades to your weapons in the game. Upon death, you lose some of that stardust, depending on what you have equipped, but not all. So, no need to worry about chasing down enemies that killed you or going back to boss fights that killed you to make sure you pick up your stardust because you don't lose access to that stuff upon death and that's where it's friendly you keep that in every souls games you all the souls you collect you either gotta catch them in if you die before you catch them in you lose them you have to go back and get them if you die again before you get them you lose them for good so this game is friendly on that uh from that standpoint Astergos will be worth multiple playthroughs and it's nearly required to unlock every achievement and trophy in the game. The achievements in this game are a bit stingy. I only finished with 300 gamer score with 50 hours of playtime and a player level of 55 and two max weapons and two max talent streets. So I played the game a lot, but if you looked at my gamer score in this game, you probably think I'm I made it through a quarter of the game, which is not true. I've done a lot in this game. It's just that you only get credit for beating bosses or uh, unlocking uh, different story arcs or alternative endings and maxing out, obviously, the collectibles. So there's a lot to do in the game. So let's talk about some of the issues that I had with Asterios. So there is no reliable map or waypoint or any direction to complete your objectives so in some games when you have like something like a path to clear or you have to they want you to go certain directions or they'll highlight certain items or highlight certain areas with like a highlighted rock or a highlighted bridge or you hit down on the thing and something will show up just guiding you uh there's some sort of little uh guide that you get but it, it's, it's not it doesn't really tell you where to go and so players will get lost um just for this they, they will get lost because the game doesn't hold your hand on that case as far as navigation or telling you exactly what to do to complete a quest so for example one of the issues i had i had a quest where i had to retrieve four keys and my object objective on the top of the screen just said retrieve four keys but there was nothing to tell me how i would uh, uh retrieve those four keys what i gotta do or where do i have to go to retrieve them so i spent my time in this area circling killing enemies uh trying to find as many path and secret pathways as i can um going and leaving the area going to different areas to see maybe if i was supposed to get this key from some place else just to find out that i had to finish a, a a conversation log with a random npc who had me do tasks and luckily because of all the stuff i did the game prior to meeting that person i've already i had all this task complete but it took me five six hours to figure that out and I lost a lot of time uh, because of that when I probably could have advanced the game uh, a, a, a lot sooner. So there are instances where players will get lost because there is no hand holding. There's no traditional map. There's no traditional waypoint. And that is sort of a knock on this game from my perspective. There are no graphic options for current gen consoles. Uh, this is a bit of a bummer. Now, the game does support AMD's new FSR super resolution technique, but I don't believe it's implemented very well. The game looks decent, but it's not striking. It doesn't look good. It doesn't look as good as last year's Kind of Bridge of the Spirits or as the 2020 game Immortals Phoenix Rising. The game is, a, is, a, is smaller in scope and the visuals still did not meet my expectations for being next gen optimized games. The game also plays a little slow to the point I thought I was playing at 30 frames per second until I learned the game is targeting 60 FPS on current gen consoles, which includes the Xbox series and the PlayStation 5. But something about it still fell off. It wasn't until I played on a PC at 90 frames per second where it felt somewhat normal. A lot of these issues would not have been uh, a big deal had the visuals been what I expected. So let me give you an example of like uh, the, uh, the performance and some of the weird things that was going on. 
The game had this weird thing where I'm not sure if it was a bug or an optimization trick to keep performance steady, but enemy AI just outside of the combat range, they moved at literally what felt or looked like a 15 frames per second clip. So anybody out of your combat range that you can uh, touch or they're out of the range where you can shoot a projectile at, you would see their animations and their motion and they would move like a, like a sideshow clip, like they're moving at like a quarter of the frame rate that the game is targeting and they look completely off. Now, once you get closer to those AI and to engage them in combat, their animations are now more on par with what the game is targeting, but it's, it's it was something I didn't expect and it looked completely off. Uh, and it, I don't know, like I said, it wasn't a bug because many restarts, uh, shutdowns of the game, restarts the game, updates that game to the game did not change that effect. So to me, I believe it's an optimization uh, trick to keep the game at a steady performance, which the game overall prefer, uh, uh, performed well. The only graphical issues that I saw was obviously there was uh, low polygon uh, uh, textures at one point, which was a bug because after I restarted the game, I didn't see that error again. But there's things like ghosting. Um, the, the visuals don't look as, as, as clean as I expected be, to be on a 4K you know, console. Um, so there were some things there that kind of just, you know, felt off about it. And like, I, I played uh, multiple uh, versions of this game just to make sure that I wasn't playing the wrong version. Um, but all in all, let's continue. A lot of the, like I said, once again, a lot of the issues would not have been a big of a deal if the visuals were high quality. Thankfully, no crashes or game breaking bugs during my 50 hours of playtime, but those visual cues do still stick out on these current gen consoles. With that, here comes the verdict. I played four versions of this game. The Xbox One S, the Xbox Series X, which I completed, the Xbox Series S, and PC via Steam. The game does support smart delivery. On Xbox One S, this version suffers from low resolution, ghosting, screen tearing at the bottom and at the top of the screen, and some lengthy, lengthy ass load times. Now, some of the parts of the games that were load times or loading zones on the Xbox One did not exist on the Xbox Series. So that, I guess that's a testament to how fast this game is on the Xbox Series and PlayStation, where I felt like there was virtually no load times, where the startup screen on the Xbox version is actually a load of screen and I didn't realize that. So um, the Xbox One version, not the greatest to uh, you know experience. Or Xbox Series X and S, now this was interesting, honestly. Um, they both played the same, they both looked the same. So, I mean, I don't know as far as like resolution, this thing targeting, I'm pretty sure there's sort of, sort of dynamic resolution scaling or there's some sort of reconstruction. Like I said, this game is using super resolution. But side by side, the Xbox Series S and the Xbox Series X version does look and run the same. No noticeable frame drops, no screen tearing. They And I played the Series S version on a non VR display. So it was like, OK, it, it, it feels like I'm looking at the, uh, the Xbox Series version. So it's not too dramatic of a difference. The uh, the PC version, obviously, you could take things up a notch. I've been playing everything on Ultra at 1440p up upgraded to a 4k where I can still achieve 60 FPS or better around like I'm more so 70 80s but at 1440p I was able to average around 100 there is no ray tracing um available for the PC version of this game um so I gotta say this um overall man Asteragos uh, Asteragos for me will is a high recommendation it is a high recommendation and, and if you if i'm going to put a score in it it has to be an eight out of ten but i will say my recommendation does vary with platform if you're on xbox one this is a less than desirable experience this is more of a six and a half seven out of ten experience if you are on the xbox series and ps5 this is a solid eight out of ten experience and if you're on a pc this is an eight and a half out of 10 experience for the graphical options and how much better it can look on PC, but it does not support RTX. I don't even think it supports DLS uh, or uh, any of that nature. Um, and I could be wrong, but at least for the settings that I was running. Um, so therefore is that, but overall for the game itself, it is to me an eight out of 10, a high recommendation. Um, and a lot of my recommendation is based off for what it is. Now, Asterikos is a great, it's a great game and it's $35. So 
So for $35 in this game, you are getting the best bang for your buck. And this is a sleep, this sleep, this is a sleeper game from Acme Games and Tiny Build. Uh, and it's probably the best of the Souls Born inspired games that came out this year compared to Still Rising and Thymesia. Um, so I definitely recommend this game for the story, for the gameplay, um, and, and just for the, the, the chance that these developers took on this game. Um, like I said, there are some lows, and that is the visuals on next gen consoles. Um, there is like, you know, the usual flaws with, you know, these uh, smaller scope games, but if for, for $35, this is a quality game. And the fact that you can probably push easily a hundred hours into this game and, and, and it'll be a well-deserved hundred hours. But if you want more from about Asterios Curse of the Stars, please check out my gameplay preview. Check out the boss fight I posted of Barat, the uh, Lord of the Black Street. Um, if you enjoyed this review, please hit the like button and don't for uh, forget to subscribe. Yes, Asterios Curse of the Stars, my verdict, 8 out of 10. Highly recommend. Thank you guys for watching. As always, Xbox is the best box and I am the best bot. Good night or good morning if you're on the other side of the globe. I'm out of here. Peace.